So I, I really welcome the opportunity to talk with you today. The, the, the first round of the, of the dialogue and the, the discussions we've had so far today are, are music to my ears. Um, I have, for the last 20 years, worked on energy and climate issues. And I run a lab at City of San Diego that studies international law. We study the design and practical impact of international law on business and on governance and so on. And one of the things that's very clear from that kind of research is that in a problem like climate or sustainable development, if you do not design international legal and normative mechanisms in a way that reflect national priorities, bottom up if you like, rather than top down, you're guaranteed to fail. And so that helps explain, I think, a lot of the difficulties we've had on the climate problem over the last 20 years. It also, I think, helps explain why these new, more flexible, bottom-up kinds of mechanisms that we see discussed now in the context of sustainable development and climate change in particular, I think they actually have a much greater chance of having a, a, a practical impact. I wasn't at the, at the latest Rio meetings, um, partly because I seem to be spending every waking hour right now involved in activities related to the IPCC. And I can say, without telling stories out of school, that we're literally today uh, in the process of writing the summary of the third working group, the working group that's on mitigation issues for the IPCC. We're in the process of writing the summary for policymakers, uh, and then eventually next year putting that forward and, and getting it approved in plenary and so on. The single most difficult thing for us to grapple with in that summary is the interaction between sustainable development um, and, uh, uh, and, and the task of mitigation and the engagement of business in particular. Because this is outside the comfort zone of everybody. Most of the key variables are hard to measure. They're hard enough to talk about. Uh, the key actors are, are often not states or they're, or they're kind of hybrid organizations that are part state, part firm, and so on. This is very, very hard for the analytical community to talk about, let alone gain the consensus on and so on. So I think one of the elements of this second round of dialogue will be to hopefully engage the academic community in practical work that can move these, uh, these, uh, these agendas forward. Um, a lot of people have said today, uh, and will say again, and will, it will be said over and over again in this dialogue process, that business has to be centrally involved, agreed, to declare victory on that front. I think the real issue here, and Paula raised this in her remarks, the real issue is, what is a practical matter does that actually mean? What actually do you do? So let me suggest six. One, is there a process question? And I think we made a lot of progress on this, still difficulties and so on, but how do you make sure that business voices are involved in the setting of goals and targets and indicators and a variety of other things? So process is very important. Second is indicators. And here, I don't know if I'm talking about a goal or a target or an indicator, so please forgive me for transgressing on the different definitions that have emerged around these concepts. But I think we need to develop, and maybe this group can take the lead on this, actual practical indicators of what it means to have business health, to have the kinds of enabling environments that Brian talked about in his slide. Um, how do we actually measure corruption, quality of institutions, rule of law, credibility of regulations, protection of intellectual property? How do we understand where protection of intellectual property is important and where it creates uh, thickets of patents that have been much in the news in some parts of the industry where actually we have excessive amounts of intellectual property protection. The good news is that today, compared with 20 years ago, there's a tremendous amount of data on this. Some of it's coming out of the UN system. Frankly, most of the really interesting data here are coming out of business organizations or quasi-business government organizations. The World Economic Forum, for example, has a truly extraordinary survey they do of business leaders around the world. Now with country resolved data, uh, that has um, about, I don't know, six, seven dozen indicators, uh, most of them squarely on the issues we're talking about here today. That's just an illustration. There are a bunch of other data sets out there as well. And so I think if we're going to move beyond people saying, yeah, business should be involved and we need to be in, and we need indicators that reflect how sustainable development issues impact business on the ground level, then somebody has to take the move to show how you do that in a quantitative framework and develop indicators. It's totally doable now would have been hard to do it two decades ago, totally doable uh, now. The third of the six things I think we need to do is we need to remember in the business community that we need also indicators of policy quality and regulation and market incentives to be green because the business, organ business organizations on their own will become green in some respects and not green in others. 
and this is that nobody thinks, almost nobody thinks, that the norm, that normal market forces are going to deliver the kind of green economy we want, or the kind of sustainable development we want. There need to be nudges and pushes, and so the question is, what about, what about the quality of those? Again, we have a lot of data now, so it's totally feasible to develop indicators uh, that would look not only at outcomes, but actually at kinds of rules, regulations, market incentives, and so on, and use those in this bottom-up process that Paula was talking about, others have been talking uh, about. So that's the third. Let me just talk briefly about the other, the other three. Fourth, the academic community. One of the things the academic community can do to be helpful is run scenarios about how the world unfolds in different ways under different kinds of circumstances. Um, and we, so far, in the modeling community, and I consider myself um, part of that community, we don't do a very good job of running scenarios that reflect the actual underlying realities that day in and day out drive a decision inside a firm about whether to invest in a new technology, whether to deploy a new kind of power plant, whether to, to invest in something that's really green or only partially green or something that's not green at all. We, we, do, we do an okay job in, in a very blunt way, but we don't actually have in our models um, the kinds of fine-grained resolution, quality of institutions, corruption, other kinds of things that we know at the ground level have a big impact on the business community. <coughs> so we in the academic community can actually do better on that front. There are a bunch of discussions under, underway related to that. So that hopefully the academic work remains a little better connected to the reality uh, of what's actually going on in business and also, frankly, so that the business community can help work better with the academic world so that the m modeling work we do is, is better connected to, uh, to reality. The fifth is I think we need to get the investment accounting right. So Brian used the example of this famous promise in Copenhagen to deliver another $100 billion a year in climate finance. And it's one of those promises that everybody's thrilled about because 100 is a big number. It's a round number, and nobody knows what it means. So that makes it really attractive. It's a little bit like sustainable development. Nobody's really sure what it means, and so everybody's thrilled about it. We have no idea how to measure that. And I think we need to be serious about this. Um, there's a really interesting study by Barbara Buchner, uh, Climate Policy Institute, showing that actual climate flows right now, depending on how you add them up, are actually like $350 billion a year. So we're already beating more than three times the act of the target here. And so if part of the policy discussion here is going to be about extra finance and extra incentives and extra investment, then we in the business community need to help get the accounting right so we can show what the normal kind of pace or pulse or uh, the pulse of investment is and then what the extra level of effort actually uh, actually might be. And it's possible now to put numbers on this. And the last thing I'll say is we need to get serious about trade and investment. And Niven's going to talk more about this later, so I'll just say a couple words about this. Com today, cross-border trade and cross-border investment are both substitutes and complements of each other. And unlike Rio 1 back in 1992, today the impact of these cross-border flows in money and in goods and services, goods in particular, the impacts of all those on the kinds of things we worry about sustainable development is just profound. So for example, there have been several studies released over the last three or four years showing that back in 1990, embodied carbon in international trade was between North and South was roughly zero, meaning when you make a ton of steel in one country uh, and then you ship that ton of steel to another country under current accounting rules, the emissions caused when you make the ton of steel get counted against the country where the steel was produced even though the real guilt, if you like, is in the country where the steel is used because that's the ultimate point of consumption. This has a huge impact on some countries' emission statistics, British emission statistics, for example, all of the achievement that's been, that's been had in Britain about reducing emissions uh, basically evaporates when you include the effects of embodied carbon in trade. And I just pick on Britain right now. My country, the United States, is in a similar position. We actually were a net exporter of carbon in 1990, and now we're a very large importer of carbon. China's a huge exporter of carbon. It is no longer possible for us to ignore these kinds of factors. We've got to get the accounting right. We've got to grapple with the practical implications of all this for the international trading system, the WTO in particular. We can now do a lot of this quantitatively. I'm not going to say more about this because I'm interested to hear what, what Niven has to say in this area. But I think for a group of firms that are transnational and international in orientation, that's a really, that's a really big deal. So let me just welcome. I, I look forward to participating in any way I can be useful in phase two. 
Um, Paula talked about everybody speaking the same language. That's a bold aspiration. Uh, I would at least like to have a translator program so that people can <laughs> understand which different languages are, are being spoken and how they, how they move back and forth. Thank you very much.